Um, our next speaker is Nico Carpentier. Um, Nico will talk on the role uh, which participation within the online plays uh, in vis-a-vis -vis power relationships and the processes which limit such participation, highlighting the systemic weaknesses of the online itself. Um, Nico Carpentier is professor in media and communication studies at the Department of Informatics and Media of Uppsala University. At the same time, he's a, a part-time associate professor in Brussels and in Prague, and the research fellow of TEPAC. Um, he has uh, uh, widely published on the media um, and uh, has a long cooperation with several Cypriot organizations. We look forward to your presentation. Thank you. Um, First of all, thanks for the invitation, for uh, giving me a break in between all the Respublica activities that are going on right now. Uh, and I'll be happy to explain why Drupi is here in about three seconds, in case you are wondering uh, why he is so happy. Uh, in a way that is the best possible introduction, because in contemporary society, this kind of happiness is often explained um, through the presence of digital technologies. Drupi is always happy because he can participate through a diversity of uh, online facilities that will realize this fantasy of uh, full democracy. And that, for me, is one of the basic connections to the theme of, of this meeting, uh, the rethinking of citizenship uh, by, by emphasizing the capacity of, of citizens to monitor, to be involved, or in other words, to participate. And uh, for those who know me, know that I, I tend to dwell slightly on this notion of participation, and you'll have to bear with me because I'm going to do that again. Uh, and I'll also even introduce my uh, narcissistic slide, which has some of the references that I used to, um, to feed into this talk, an old book on media and participation, a newer one on the discursive material not, but also some work that was published in Yafnost, which is called Beyond the Ladder of Participation. I'll, uh, I'll use some of these publications uh, to feed into my talk. I don't think Drupi is mentioned in these books, though. So. You have to forgive me for that. That will be the next book, Droopy and Participation. Um, but what the starting point of a lot of these reflections on participation is, is a very simple idea. Um, and that's that the notion of participation itself is, is, of course, a practice that is linked to democracy, intimately linked to democracy. But it, as a concept, it is also part of these ideological practices. So the way we define participation is not outside the logics of democracy and participation. It's actually integrated. Um, the definitions, the um, discussions on how to define participation, how to, and going back to the, the references of social constructivism, uh, how to construct the concept of participation are highly political themselves. And that's sort of the starting point. Now, academia, obviously, for those uh, who disagree, I'll, I'll excuse, but I'll ex uh, sort of apologize. But the academia is, of course, also part of this societal political debate. And also our work, the way we define that notion of participation, is very much embedded in this political ideological reality. At the same time, because of this political uh, background of the notion of the construction of participation, we also see that the notion itself becomes highly fluid. And a number of people have commented on this. One of my favorite quotes comes from Carol Pateman. It's one of my favorites because it's so old. Right? In 1970, she wrote that the widespread use of the term of participation has tended to mean that any precise meaningful content has almost disappeared. And I think she's still right. I still think that the point that she made then is, is extremely valid. Now, I would also argue that the reason why this notion of participation is so fluid is that it is a political 
notion that is constantly contested. Different groups in society are constantly trying to argue for different meanings, different intensities attributed to the notion of participation. But that also produces a academic problem because if one of your key concepts is fluid, it gets a bit more difficult to use it in academic research and academic theory building. And there are two ways that academics have dealt with this. And one is the more traditional way, and that is to rescue it, to fixate the real meanings of participation. And uh, this is a classic example. Uh, it's Shal uh, Sherry uh, Arenstein's uh, ladder of participation with the different strands, with the core idea being some of the social practices are labeled participatory, but they're not, while others are. And the difference here has to do with the very simple notion of power. Right? If you look at the upper strand, you'll clearly see the reference to citizen power. These are genuine participatory practices. Others are tokenist or are non-participatory, therapeutic, manipulative. But there are some other authors in other areas, uh, writers in other areas, that have actually made more or less the same argument. Uh, this gets even more interesting, interesting because this is 1924. Uh, Laszlo Moli Nagui writing about theater and trying to rethink the logics of theater in a wonderful language, arguing that uh, they needed a different kind of stage activity that will no longer permit the masses to be silent spectators, uh, not only in exciting them inwardly, but then comes the quote, let them take hold and participate, actually allow them to fuse with the action on the stage at the peak of cathartic ecstasy. At the peak of cathartic ecstasy is a wonderful way of referring to these participatory practices. Now in Lod, even the OACD has developed a ladder of participation, distinguishing between what they call active participation, consultation, information distribution. So, a lot of authors, a lot of organizations have argued we have something like real participation and then we have something else, whether it's consultation, whether it's manipulation. But there is this dichotomy that is built into this way of thinking that doesn't always help us to better understand the struggles behind the notion of participation itself. And that's the second approach, which emphasizes the fact that participation is a contested signifier, that it is a notion that is political in its very core. And just to give you one very quick overview of how these discussions, these struggles are being waged in the field of democratic theory, well, there's not one democratic theory. There's a huge diversity of democratic theories. If you take David Held's book as an example, there's only one letter that matters in this title. It's the little, the little s in models of democracy. There's not one, there's a diversity of models and they're actually competing with each other. Not just over time, surely they do compete over time. Up there is classical democracy, which is of course quite old and it's not seen as, in a contemporary context, as a viable model. But you also see a competition, a struggle over these different elements of democracy within the same context, within the same country, within the same culture. And then what links up my discussion on participation with democratic theory is this very simple basic idea that democracy is always constituted out of a balance between, on the one hand, representation, the delegation of power, and participation, the sharing of power. Every democratic model, every democratic theory has a balance. But my point is, every democratic theory will have a different balance between these two, and the struggle is actually about where to put the balance, where the equi equilibrium uh, works. But this is not just a matter of looking at democratic theory, looking at the world of politics. And there I can use Chantal Mouffe, who's argued for a distinction between the political and politics, where the political is a much broader range of practices of conflict that characterize social reality, and where politics is the more institutionalized version. And you can use that argument to also claim that the discussions on participation, the struggle over participation, is not just part of politics, but it's part of the political. So if you go to a museum 
And if you're standing in front of the artwork, you could argue, well, this is a moment of participation. And some authors that are invested in what is called cultural participation would call this a participatory practice. I don't. I call this art access. Because the power position of that person is virtually zero. What she can do is a few things. She can lead. True. Yay. She can take out a little razor blade and do her own cut-up experiment. Sure. But basically, there is no decision-making power when it comes to creating, producing, and placing the artwork there. Right? That's beyond her position. And for that reason, I would call this art access, but others would call this a participatory practice. And this is exactly where language, communication, and struggle over the notion of participation kick in. What I would argue is that we need to distinguish a series of, of concepts, look at participation as different from in interaction, look at it as different from access, in order to better understand what this struggle is about. And if you want to have it in different versions, I can show you, but for reasons of time, I want to now switch to my French course. Anybody speaks French here? Yeah, well, okay. Ah, this is cheating. <laughs> but you can translate. You can help me out. We can have an interactive, non-participatory moment. <laughs> Je participe? Tu participes? Il participe? Elle ne participe pas? So there's no she participates on this one, by the way. Nous participons? Vous participez? Il profite. They take advantage, right? So what's be, this is a poster from May 68, and it actually captures the definition of participation the way I see it. It's basically about power. It's about sharing power and the capacity to decide. And in many cases, participation is not actually realizing, putting into practice this idea of, of sharing power. And there have been a number of authors that have made this point, and Carol Paitman is actually one of the key authors to, to emphasize the, the role of power in thinking about participation and participation as a struggle. But, and that's the second point I want to make, if we understand participation as this struggle, if we see it as different ways of sharing power with different intensities, then we need to look at the online and the promises that the online beholds for online participation and the ways we talk about it, the ways we think about participation in the context of a, uh, a 21st century. And I would argue in the ways that we think about the capacities of online participation, there are a couple of problems. And I want to rather briefly, because at some point we should end this meeting and there are still two uh, other speakers and the reception. I briefly want to sort of raise five problem areas in our thinking about participation and the online. One has to do with cultures of leadership. It is one of the areas where we don't go into, where we do not necessarily talk about when we talk about online participation. But of course, in many cases, when we deal, about, deal with the decentralization of power or the centralization of power, we also talk about leadership. What does it mean to be a leader is then the question that comes up. It's a very black box question. It's a question we don't ask that much. What kind of leadership do we have? And I would argue that if you go into the history of leadership theory and the work, for instance, of Kurt Lewin, we see that there are ways of thinking about leadership in extremely democratic ways. And others have built on Lewin's work to actually think about a distinction between authoritarian leadership and democratic leadership. It's one of the areas when we talk about online participation where we actually don't think about that much and where I think we should. Number two, and the next slide will be a lot of sheep. You'll understand in a second. When we think about online participation, the concepts we use are 
quite often con community networks, the multitude is a classic concept that's been used for quite a lot, but it, it raises issues on how we see these communities and what kind of um, power positions we see within these communities and we see these communities of having in relationship to particular elites. And this is, of course, one version of this relationship. Right? If we're all the community of sheep, then maybe participation is not necessarily helping us. If we are part of the Leviathan to bring back good old Hobbes, there might be a number of, of issues that we need to address. So how we see these communities as empowered or maybe as less empowered is a key issue. And again, I think that our emphasis on communities, multitudes, networks has moved us away from one very key component of the social structure, and that's the organization. If we want to think about power structures and strengthening and empowering uh, ordinary citizens, we might need to think and rethink of the importance of organizations in the logics within the online. But what we see instead, people like Clay Shirky that are saying like, oh, we are now living in a new way that is basically a non-organized way, where the multitude, where diversity of, uh, of individuals come together and accidentally almost organically do things. Well, I would argue that if we want to rethink power, if we want to rethink the way power works in a more decentralized way, we also need to think about what organizations can do to help that instead of ignoring them. And there the logics, of course, becomes, the question becomes, what about the participatory organization? Can we have organizations within this logics of democratization with democratic leadership that allow us to rethink the, the social structure in a more participatory democratic way. I would argue that this is perfectly feasible, but then we should complement our thinking about communities, our thinking about networks, our thinking about the multitude with a new thinking about organizations as well, instead of just arguing that we need to get rid of them because they are necessarily hierarchical. Right? The Sharpie argument. Third point, political action. Well, we can, of course, argue about the, the rhizomatic... Okay. Thank you. We can, of course, argue about the rhizomatic nature of political actions, where we all become interconnected. And this is typical of our thinking about online participation. It's connecting citizens. And all of a sudden, out of this wonderful rhizomatic reality, we'll have new forms of political action. Well, there is also something called the offline. And interestingly enough, if we look at some of the key elements of political action, uh, they were very material. For instance, in reclaiming uh, squares, right? uh, the Arab Spring uh, revolutions, we can discuss whether that word is, is appropriate, but anyway, the Arab Spring revolutions were very material in the organization of political action, even though many people insisted on calling them social media or Facebook revolutions. They were extremely material, offline, in other words, with an integration of, of the offline and the online. If we look at Occupy Wall Street or even Occupy the Buffer Zone, we see very material interventions. Now, we should not forget the importance of the square, the importance of material locations of political action. My fourth point, and I am taking you back to May 68, if we want to understand political action, if we want to understand online participation, we also have to look at utopias. We also have to look at opportunities for changing the world. Can we still change the world as happened in May 68? Or as in the French Revolution of 1789? Is that still an opportunity? Or are we actually caught up in these wonderful parodies where we use brilliant forms of humor, but are not capable of affecting structural change. So can we still, apart from dreaming, this is the wonderful beach which sort of all the, the visitors to the island will appreciate, can we have this social imaginary of radical democracy and maximalist participation realized, or are we caught up in a trap 
where political action is basically only an illusion that we, a, a fantasy that we can never put into practice. And the fifth area, and this is my last area, uh, the fifth problem area of online participation is that we still haven't enough looked at the hardcore radical right-wing forms of online participation. If Stormfront, a radical neo-Nazi group, is organizing wonderful participatory moments online, arguing that they should go and kill some people in a very democratic participatory way, is this still participatory? And we shouldn't we be looking at this? Now, slowly but surely, and actually, ironically, I would never think that I would say this, but thanks to Trump, we're slowly moving into looking at the radical right and their forms of online participation. And this is a, a key analytical uh, moment. And let me skip a few things. I, will, I won't take you into the world of the mods. I will actually go to, uh, to that famous conclusion that we all need to have. If we start thinking about online participation and its problems, the first point that I wanted to make and I wanted to emphasize is that we need to look at participation as a permanent struggle. Not just a permanent struggle over the division of power, but also a permanent struggle over the notion of participation itself. That it's part of this permanent struggle. The participatory intensities are just as contested um, as the concept itself is. But at the same time, we should not celebrate. Uh, and there, is, I tend to take some, uh, a different pathway than, for instance, the work of Henry Jenkins, who has been emphasizing a participatory culture. Uh, and I've had wonderful discussions with him uh, where he slowly argued that we are now living not in a world of participatory culture, but of more participatory culture. So I managed to add four letters to his vocabulary. The reason we engaged in this discussion was that there is a very strong need to emphasize the dark side of participation, where participation is not realized, where it fails, where it doesn't produce the desired outcomes. Because it is still extremely difficult to escape from these unbalanced power relationships, from these very strong forms of both governing and governmentality, where we actually end up governing ourselves. And there is, I would argue, as a counter-movement to this difficulty to escape from that unbalanced power reality, there is a very strong need to further the democratization of democracy, the deepening of democracy, as others have called it, in all societal fields, politics for one, but also the arts, also the media, in order to establish a more fair uh, form of society where citizens actually do more than paying lip service to the logics of participation. And I thank you. Thank you very much.